I want you to take a look at the screen. Maybe it looks like an eye chart. Can any of you tell me what all those letters stand for? I don't think so. <laughs> they stand for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersexual, pansexual, two-spirit, androgynous, asexual, and ecosexual. Now, ecosexual, there seem to be a couple meanings there. It can be used for people who find nature, trees, flowers, streams, you know, sexually attractive. Or it's been used by folks who refuse to have any type of sexual relationship with anyone who does not share their views on environmental issues. Those are 13 of the at least 26 different designations of sexual identity with which people have come up. So when asked to check male, female, or other, that's what other covers. Some of you are thinking, Pastor Dan, that's ridiculous. People are male or female. Sex is supposed to be between a, between a man and a woman, married to each other, and, and I agree with that. But some of you would also add, and it's not something we need to talk about in church. With that, I would disagree. We should talk about sex because the Bible talks about sex and because sexual promiscuity, sexual addictions, sexual abuse, and sexual confusion are significant problems in our culture. And yet my fear is that when it comes to issues of sexuality, some of us think that the people out there are so goofed up, it doesn't even pay to have a conversation with them. <laughs> we, however, are the ones who through Jesus, who through what God has revealed in his word, and we, I mean, not just pastors, but all of us, we are the ones who can provide light in the darkness for those who are confused. We are the ones who can offer hope and healing to those who are sexually wounded. We need to speak to the people out there. We need to speak to the people within our walls, including our children, in language that is clear and which makes sense to them. And we need to speak and live in ways that will motivate them to listen to what we have to say. This morning, we're concluding our series on crucial questions. Next week, we go back to the Gospel of Luke, which is, seems really easy compared to the sermon. <laughs> really easy. But my question is this, can sexual sanity be restored? And I believe the answer is yes, and I'm convinced that, that we're the ones that, that God wants to use in restoring sexual sanity, maybe not to our whole society, but to at least some of the individuals around us. And let's just pause and pray the Lord would use our time together this morning to help us do just that. Thank you, Father, for your word, the Bible, the truth we find in it. Grateful, Lord, that uh, it is truth that transcends cultures and generations. And, Lord, we need your help. This is, this is tough stuff. We need your help in understanding truth today, understanding how to apply it. And so give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. In case you have not noticed, during the past 50 years, American society has gone through a massive change in its understanding of sexual morality. For, for hundreds and hundreds of years, most people in the United States and in Europe before that accepted the biblical Christian view that a sexual relationship is to be, to be between a man and woman married to each other. During the sexual revolution of the 1960s, people began to question that standard. And by about 10 years ago, the dominant view, at least within academic, media, and entertainment circles, has become this. People should be free to have a sexual relationship with whomever they want, whenever they want, 
as long as it's between consenting adults. And, and in the last few years, this has also been added. People should be able to define their sexual identity and express that identity in any way they choose. That's where all the letters come from. O over thousands of years, people have, have broken the rules about sexual behavior. That's not the question. People have always broken the rules. A and that's still true today. However, in our time, many folks do not believe any such rules even exist. So we've gone for a time when people understood what the rules were and they frequently broke them to a time when people now do not think there are any rules. Now, just to be clear, at Chisholm Baptist as a Christian church and I as a Christian pastor believe what the Bible teaches. We believe the sexual relationship is to be between a man and woman married to each other. We believe God created us as male and female, two uh, complementary, complementary genders. And we also recognize that these views put us in the minority in American society at this time. But that's okay, because we're committed to strive to uphold what is true and what's right and what's good, even if it's not popular at the moment. And, and my belief is that much of the current thinking about this topic has become pretty much disconnected from reality. And it is important that we articulate a biblical perspective on sexuality, and, and in doing so, our goal is not just to proclaim but persuade. We don't want to just tell people this is what the Bible says. We want to help them see that what it says is true. And, and we need to do that for a couple of reasons. One, we, we do want to change how people think because that's what determines their behaviors. God, God does not give us rules about sex because he is against people having fun. The rules are there to help us experience happiness and wholeness in our lives. It, it is good for individuals and good for societies to follow the rules that God has established. In fact, I, I think as a society, we, we all pay a price when those rules are ignored. A, a second reason to clearly articulate a biblical perspective on sexuality is maybe even more important. We need to make sure our views do not become an unnecessary barrier, which is keeping people from hearing and believing the gospel. Friends, if we're to be faithful to Jesus, we, we must not deny or distort the biblical standards. We, we cannot tell people that the rules God has given no longer matter. However, we do want to make it clear to the watching world that we are not hateful bigots. We want them to know that our love and concerns for people extends to everyone. That includes to people who are involved in sexual sin. It includes people who choose to identify as something other than male and female. Our love and concern for people extends to everyone. Now, if people reject the Bible and the great news of Jesus Christ because they refuse to consider any religion that insists that there are rules about sexual behavior, I'm not sure there's much we can do about that. However, if the reason people refuse to consider Christianity is because they misunderstand what the Bible says or, or do not understand why it's true, then perhaps it is our problem. When it comes to sexuality, we need to work on being able to explain what we believe and why we believe it. And we need to be able to do this graciously. 
Remember, our, our goal is not just to proclaim the truth. It's to persuade. And, and through the Apostle Paul, the Lord gives us very important instructions on how we're to do that. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Uh, opponents must be gently instructed in hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. The passage speaks about a number of important truths, but let me highlight two. First of all, this, this whole discussion is a spiritual battle. It's because people have been blinded by the evil one that they believe his lies and he's told a whole host of lies about sexuality that people in our culture are swallowing, often hook, line, and sinker. And because it's a spiritual battle, it, it is God, not us. It's God, not us, who can enable people to see the truth and to turn from their error. It's God who ultimately changes people's hearts and minds. However, that, that doesn't mean our words and actions are not important. Paul gives the instructions he does because God uses our avoidance of quarrels. He uses our kindness, our clear teaching, our gentle instruction to change people's hearts and minds. And when it comes to all the controversial issues and involving sexuality, it is so important, so important, that we gently and clearly explain what we believe and why we believe it. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to tell you about a conversation I had with my friend Joe. Um... You've heard of Joe. He's not gay, but uh, uh, he, he believes in God. Uh, he, he reads the Bible sometimes, uh, occasionally comes to church, but he's, he's not a Christian. He's not really a believer in Christ. His sister Joan, who, who considers herself a lesbian, just got married to her same-sex partner. A and Joe is upset because... His co-worker, a devout Christian, told him he should not have gone to Joan's wedding. Joe says to me, Dan, I can't believe how judgmental and bigoted you Christians are. So, so I'm not supposed to go to my own sister's wedding? You, you guys talk about love, love, but, but I see a lot more hate when it comes to gays and lesbians. Wait a minute, Joe. You, you know I, I don't hate Joan. I, I think she's a wonderful person. I, I don't approve of some of her choices, including her same-sex relationship, but that does not mean I don't care about her. I, I don't understand why that's so hard for people to figure out. I, I, I do not approve of some of the choices my, my four sons make, but that certainly doesn't mean I don't love them just because I don't approve of some of their choices. And Joe, I'd, li I'd like to be clear. You know, if, if I say something that makes you think, oh, Dan, he doesn't care about Joan. If, if I say something that makes you think that, you're, you're mistaken. Because I do care about her. I, I, I love her. And, if I, and on the other hand, if I say something that makes you think, well, I can see Dan really cares about Joan. He must approve of her lesbian lifestyle. You're mistaken. I don't approve, even though I care very much about her as a person. But Dan, but Dan that, that's what I don't get. Why don't you approve of her lifestyle? That's her choice. You know, I've been doing some reading lately, 
Do you know that there are some pastors who, who don't think the Bible really teaches that homosexuality is a sin? Well, I know that, Joe, but I'm, I'm pretty sure those, those pastors are wrong. For almost 2,000 years, there was a near unanimous agreement within the Christian church that homosexual behavior was sinful. That's because of prohibitions in both the Old and New Testaments. The clearest is in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Joe, I really do not know how someone can read that and then say that the Bible teaches that God is okay with homosexual behavior. But Dan, I, I was reading an article that said homosexuality was, was something different in the first century than it is today. Uh, back then it was often coercive, uh, pederasty, uh, not the loving, consensual relationships that exist today. Joe, that, that's pure speculation. And, and, and nothing in the text indicates that Paul was referring to coercive relationships. That clearly seems like a 21st century attempt to twist the meaning of Scripture in order to rationalize behavior. Well, maybe, maybe so, Dan, but I don't know why people make such a big deal about this. Jesus never condemned homosexuality. You, you Christians are supposed to follow him, follow Jesus, not Paul. Well, Joe, when it, when it comes to what the Bible says, Jesus and Paul speak with one voice, but that's a topic for another day. It, it, it may be true that Jesus never specifically addressed the whole topic of homosexuality, but he clearly affirmed the authority of the Old Testament, which is very explicit in its disapproval of homosexual behavior. And when it comes to same-sex marriage, Jesus said this, Mark chapter 10, 6 through 8. But from the beginning of creation... God made them male and female. Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's a pretty clear affirmation of what we call traditional marriage. It's why I believe that even though a same-sex couple may be married in the eyes of the state of Minnesota, they're not really married in the eyes of God. Oh, I don't know, Dan. You, you know the Bible better than I do. Maybe it does say homosexuality is a sin, but, but, but Joan can't help it. She was born that way. How, how can God be angry with her for that? Okay, Joe, hang on for a second here. Wait a minute. The, the Bible is clear that homosexual behavior is sinful. But I'm not sure exactly what you mean by homosexuality. If you're talking about same-sex attraction, you know, being sexually attracted to, to a, uh, someone of the same sex, that seems more like temptation rather than a sin. There's a, a big difference between being tempted and giving in to that temptation. Now, when it comes to sex, heterosexual or homosexual, <laughs> there's that area in between temptation and acting on that temptation called lust. And, and Jesus made it very clear that lustful thoughts, heterosexual or homosexual, that those thoughts are sinful as well. When, when does a sinful thought become lust? Well, when we start enjoying and trying to prolong the thought instead of getting it out of our mind. Now, I, I don't know if Joan was born with something that inclined her to be attracted to other women. There's no proof that sexual orientation is genetically determined or even influenced. Yet, even if it is, that really isn't the issue. Joe, I, I, I don't think it is a sin for your sister to have feelings that she may not be able to avoid having, but she has choices about what she will do with those feelings. 
She's the one who decides whether she will act on them or not. So then you're not, you're not one of those Christians who thinks you can just pray the gay away. You, you don't think that Joan can just pray and become straight? Well, I, I believe that by God's grace that anyone can change. And there are numerous Christians who were once living a homosexual lifestyle who will testify they no longer struggle with same-sex attraction. But I also know they are a minority Many folks have spent countless hours praying and, and begging God to change their desires, but nothing has happened. The gay didn't go away. And in my opinion, it, it, it probably makes more sense for someone dealing with, with same-sex attraction to focus on being celibate rather than trying to change their desires. But then you make it sound like celibacy is some easy path to follow. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. Well, Joe, I, I know celibacy is not easy. But I also know many single, celibate people living happy, fulfilled lives. Unfulfilled sexual desires may seem painful, but they are often part of life. Why? because most of us are a bit messed up when it comes to our sexual desires. It's our desires that, that really aren't pleasing to the Lord. They flow from our fallen nature, the, the indwelling sin with which we struggle. We usually think that acting to fulfill those desires will make us happy. But we may be very wrong. Those actions can get us into trouble. For example, Joe, you and Sue have been married for over 20 years. You, you, you've told me that you've been faithful. You've been sexually faithful to her for that whole time, and that's wonderful. But you've also said <laughs> that it's not been easy. Like 90% of men, you are, are tempted to lust. It, it, it happens with some frequency. But the Lord expects us to fight that temptation. He expects you to not give in to those sexual desires. You've probably had the desire to sleep with another woman on numerous occasions during these past 20 years, but it is a very good thing that you did not fulfill that desire. I think the Bible's pretty clear. The Lord expects either monogamy or celibacy from each of us. If you're married, monogamy. If you're single, celibacy. Neither is usually very easy. Yet that is the path we are to follow if we're seeking to please the Lord. Oh, Dan, I, I don't know. I just don't think some people should get to decide what's right for other people. Okay, Joe, let, let me ask you this question. Do you think there should be any rules about sexual behavior at all? Any rules at all? Well, I don't, I don't know. May, maybe. Well, well, do you think uh, sexual relationships should, should be consensual? Or is rape okay? Well, of course not. Well, well, how about adults and children? No, no. Dan, sex should be between consenting adults, and nobody should try to tell two consenting adults what they can or cannot do. So, Joe, that means that if Sue decides to have an affair with the guy across the street, you're okay with that. After all, they're consenting adults. But, but that would be wrong. She'd be, she'd be cheating on me. I know, Joe, but, but why is it wrong? Just because you think it is? You know, many folks think adultery is no big deal unless their spouse is the one having the affair. Then it becomes a very big deal. You know, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think any of us have the right to decide what choices another person should make. I do believe, however, God has the right to decide what choices all of us should be making. He is, after all, the creator and sovereign of the universe. 
And if he doesn't decide what's right and wrong, then we're left with total moral anarchy and confusion. The bottom line is that rape is wrong because God says it's wrong. Pedophilia and incest are wrong because, because God says they're wrong. And adultery, Sue's or yours or mine or anyone else's, it's wrong because God says it is. Homosexual behavior, well, if, if God says it's wrong, then it is, no matter what you or I or, or anyone else thinks. The fact, I don't approve of, of same-sex marriage, that, that's no big deal. But if God doesn't approve, that is a very big deal. Okay, Dan, you've given me lots of stuff to think about, but, but I, I'm not sure I buy it. I, I, I'm still not sure homosexuality is wrong. I, I just want to be able to support Joan in, in the choice she's making. I know, Joe, but will you at least acknowledge this? In discussions about all the LGBT plus issues, the, the Christian view, what the Bible teaches and what people have believed for thousands of years, that view should at least be considered. Just because someone doesn't believe in same-sex marriage, it doesn't believe that person is hateful or that he or she is a bigot. It doesn't mean that she's, he or she is homophobic or afraid of LGBT people. It probably just means the person has sincere moral convictions based on what God reveals in the Bible. And I think that's a much more solid basis for moral convictions than anything else to which people are appealing. Oh, I know that some Christians, uh, or at least some who call themselves Christians, say uh, some pretty hateful things on this topic. That's wrong. That's sinful. Because God has given us instructions not only about sexual behavior, he, he's been given instructions how we treat one another, how we speak to each other. And that includes people of a variety of sexual preferences and backgrounds. In fact, Jesus says it includes even your enemies. You have to treat them with respect and love. And Joe, the most important thing I want you or anyone who's been listening to our conversation, guys, to realize that, that all of us fall short of the standards God has set. Whether it's sexually immoral behavior, lustful thoughts, harsh words, hateful attitudes, or maybe even driving too slow in the fast lane, every single one of us, as the Bible says, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. We're all sinners. Now, now the common thinking is, well, if that's the case, if we're all sinners, if we're all in the same boat, then being a sinner is really not that big of a deal. <laughs> but it is. It is a big deal. Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, physical death and spiritual death. That means eternal death, hell. That's a really big deal. And that's what all of us, heterosexual sinners and homosexual sinners, all of us, people who do horrible things and, and people who just have a, a nasty thoughts, all of us face that eternal death. However, there's some great news in the second part of the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Joe, the rest of Joe and the rest of you listening, that's, that's the best news in the world. Through his death on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty which all of us as sinners deserve. He offers forgiveness, freedom, and eternal life to all who turn to him. That means you need to stop trusting in yourself, stop thinking you're good enough and can make it on your own. And instead, as God enables, place your trust, your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first step to sexual sanity. More importantly, it is the first step to spiritual sanity. Trusting in Jesus frees us from the penalty 
of the sins we have and will commit. It's what brings us home to heaven. And that's a time and a place where we'll be free from sin. <laughs> free from sinful behaviors. Free from sinful desires. It's through the gospel that sexual sanity and spiritual sanity can be restored. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the word of God, the Bible. Help us, Lord, in the midst of a very difficult time to understand and believe and speak that truth in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name.